tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. I see that Past has been bemoaning his station again. I hesitate to say he's been doing it forever, but given how he exists, more or less, simultaneously throughout every moment of history prior to this one, the present, which is my domain, and in a constant state of flux as it happens, I suppose it's not an unfair perspective all in all. I, as I assume you've deduced already, am the ghost of Christmas present. You can simply call me present. While past has a point also, that spending his corporeal time on your plane, digging through old memories, and how much of a downer that can be, consider the frantic immediacy of my position. With every passing moment, I surrender one part of my existence to past while having to accept a new one from future. Not all that unlike you humans, I suppose, but as I am not human, this state of being temporally locked in one constantly evolving moment can be, at the very least, tiring. To borrow a page from past, do you remember that I Love Lucy episode where Lucy and Ethel start working in a chocolate factory and struggle comically to keep up with the conveyor belt? <laughs> I love that episode. Yet at the same time, that's often what my work feels like. As soon as a subject is passed along to me, it's off to the races, you see. I have no more of an idea of where we'll be going prior to us going there than they do, as it's the moments they miss out on with the emotional significance that draw us there. It's only upon arrival that I am afforded the broader perspective in what it means. This isn't to say I'm not prepared, but putting together the proper context for the events as they unfold, despite possessing a slight dab of prescience, absolutely requires one to think on their feet. Even though I don't actually have feet. But still, it's a small complaint in comparison to the sorts of impact and ideally consequence my subjects come to recognize as they begin to put past and present together in their mind. One such instance which springs immediately to mind will be that of a woman we'll simply refer to as Dolores. An elderly widow whose husband actually died on Christmas due to a heart attack. Dolores was less the bitter and cantankerous bah humbugger one typically thinks of when it comes to this work, but rather one trapped in sadness and grief. She and her husband had shared a long life together before his passing, and raised a rather happy family along the way. However, after his death, she became withdrawn. Her communication with her children and grandchildren becoming sparser and less frequent over the years. Christmas, quite naturally, became less a source for joy and togetherness as much as a cause for mournful reflection and a deep sense of loss. Almost always spent alone and away from what had grown through grandchildren to be a rather large family. By the time past handed Dolores off to me that Christmas Eve, the usual sense of inspired nostalgia the subjects come to me with was absent, with only a deeper and more mournful disposition in its place. Not the easiest of cases to work, believe me. Yet, as we checked in with her now grown children, whose own children were well into their teen years, with one preparing them to college, she was suddenly struck by how much her aging eldest son resembled his late father. 
He smiled and laughed with his children in almost the exact same way her husband had. The resemblance, she said, was uncanny. Seeing the gathered family sit for dinner, their faces alight and smiling with the joy of each other's company, brought a sincere and therefore rare smile to the old woman's face. However, it was the sight of an empty seat before which sat an empty table setting, which as the moment itself informed me, was set out every year for her. Genuine tears, in themselves an unusual mix of melancholy and joy, flowed freely. Regret, despite what past says, is not limited to mere memory as it requires the present moment to reflect within upon the moments missed or remembered from before. Future would go on later to inform me that in her few remaining years, she never missed a single Christmas, Thanksgiving, birthday, or really any opportunity to reconnect with her family, who were overjoyed the following day as she joined them for breakfast. These are the sorts of cases I really enjoy. Not just for how they turn out, but as in the moment, to see catharsis of that sort, to see someone bound and shackled by their grief finally find some relief by exposing them to the vivacity of the now, always brings a smile to whatever face they may be wearing on the job. I suppose that is what I really relish about this occupation, if you will. The opportunity to see healing of the human soul in real time. In my time. However, not all cases turn out so well. Many, if not most of our subjects, become the Scrooges, which, by the way, I can't stand that term. Embittered due to some trauma in their pasts. For Dolores, it was the sudden death of her husband and the emotional resonance Christmas held after becoming the recurring anniversary of his passing. For another kid, who we'll call Martin, who likewise lost someone close, no such catharsis could be found. Though we try our very best, not every case works out in the end. Martin was a young man in his thirties when tragedy struck. He had been living with a girlfriend with whom real love had just begun to blossom. They had been friends and then lovers. And as time progressed and the two moved in together, their love for one another deepened. In many senses, she became the center of his universe and his anchor to which the story of his life was to be tethered. It was a cool, late September morning when he awoke beside her in their bed. Offering her a good morning, he was at first confused when she failed to reply. He chuckled a bit at first, assuming she was simply sleeping deeply. The night prior, the pair had gone out for a night on the town. Drinks were enjoyed and then perhaps a few more. That night they had made it safely home, made love, prepared to turn in and went to bed. Prior to her climbing in between the sheets, she took some over-the-counter medication she would commonly use to avoid headaches or hangovers. Though rare, during the night, as they slept, the combination of those and the alcohol caused her to go in cardiac arrest. She died then, quietly, peacefully laying beside her love. Martin tried again to wake her, shaking her by the leg, only to notice then that her body was stiff as a board. She was lying face down, and as he fought to deny the creeping realization of what he was looking at, Martin began to panic and turned her over, calling her name over and over, until he saw her face. It was a mix of white and purple, as blood had begun pooling along her jawline and lips. Her mouth looked almost like she'd applied purple lipstick, and for 
a few fleeting moments, the final moments of his hope. He thought perhaps her makeup had merely smeared, and that she was indeed merely just in a deep sleep. This moment passed, and the reality then sank in. As the police questioned him and the medical examiners came to bag up and remove her body, an inescapable, albeit entirely misplaced sense of guilt began to wash over him. It had been his idea to go out for drinks. He had purchased the medicine. He had plans to cook for them. Naturally, had he done so that night, instead of going out, she'd still be alive. There was no end to the ways in which he created to lay blame for her passing with himself, each entirely fabricated, but manifested in his mind nonetheless. When his case came to us, it was not so much a matter of overcoming bitterness, but rather overcoming the trauma of what had happened. Martin had seen death before, as the year prior he sat with his brother at his father's deathbed and saw the old man off. That too had occurred in September, making the month and season it then led into a bitter and painful experience. However, the natural passing of an older man with long-standing health problems was a mild shock compared to the sudden death of what just the night before had been a vibrant young woman whom he loved and planned his life largely around. With cases such as these, Past's job is standardly less to recall regrets from before, allowing for context and the stages of this process to come, and instead cover the important and happy moments they shared, which made their time together special. By the time Martin came to me, he was numbed. No amount of present moments shone through him to revive within him any sense of joy seemed to really take. This is in effect the nature of trauma, wherein something so drastic and devastating happens, the understanding of one's life story becomes stuck and locked, ending at that moment. The ability to process and recognize new moments is largely lost, causing not only the person to be unable to truly create new memories, but also envision a future. This was the case with Martin. Though I tried my very best to show him, there was still a present for him to live within and by extension a future that not only awaited him, but that he could forge to his desire. No amount of Christmas scenes featuring friends and family could shake him from the haunting memory of that morning. To him, Christmas could not be joyous, as it could not be shared with her. Attempts by those same friends and family to include him in their festivities and togetherness only served to Martin as constant reminders of what he lost. Having never properly accepted her death, and therefore having never properly incorporated it into his ongoing life, he became mired in the past, leaving little of consequence that either I or future could offer. To hear future tell it afterwards, the only future he had to show Martin was the inevitability of his own death. The remainder being a single, continuous strand anchored to that one dreadful morning, with little else ever making any serious sense or impact. Much as every moment I would show him, being inexorably tied to his feelings of loss and grief and guilt. I always find those cases to be the worst. Thankfully, they aren't more common than they are, but every so often they occur, and there's nothing we can do. I like to think I take failure in stride, however, as for every Martin I come across, usually three or four Doloreses come my way to lift my spirits. Fundamentally, though, while reflection and memory are vitally important as they weave together the story of one's life, people all too often spend too much time with them, missing what is right in front of them and the chance to build new memories as they go. I suppose 
That's where I come in. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.